I'll be reading Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. You can find the words in your bulletin. I will be reading from the New International Version. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. This is the word of the Lord. Now, when I was a child, and I don't think I told the search committee this, but when I was a child, I loved, I loved wrestling. You know, that, that thing you'd watch on USA or, or TBS, or, and now on Fox on Friday nights, WWE wrestling, you know. I loved it so much that I would watch it on Monday nights and Thursday nights and even on Friday nights sometimes. Uh, and my love for wrestling, it's not wrestling down south, it's wrestling. Uh, my love for wrestling began uh, when I was a kid uh, because my family, my sisters and I would go every summer to visit some dear friends that we called family. Uncle Gene and Reedy and Gene Jr., their son, uh, and Gene Jr. would sit downstairs in, his, in the den and, and watch wrestling whenever we were there at wrestling, whenever we were there, and so I would too. And so I grew to love this, and we would watch it all the time. And when my family was living in Macon, Georgia, uh, we, uh, my, my good friend Denny, his, uh, his, his dad worked for, uh, of all things, a beer company, and he got us tickets to go see WWE wrestling. And he had tickets for us on the front row. Now, I was probably eight at the time. And uh, when, while we were sitting there, one of the main events came on. And there was a guy named the British Bulldog. You may not remember this guy. Uh, Claire might remember, though, because she used to watch wrestling, too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the British Bulldog... Uh, for whatever reason, I didn't like him, so I started yelling at him as he was walking towards me and away from me, and he turned around, and he said, shut up, you little toad, in his British accent. <laughs> and being only eight or nine years old, and still believing that this style of wrestling was real, I took his advice. Now, it was during high school that I began to realize, and I started to lose interest in wrestling because I realized that it was fake. I'm sorry to break the news to you. It's fake. Um, but when I read the story of Jacob this week, my mind went back to those days. Went back to my understanding of what wrestling was or wrestling was. Um, and I just remember... I, as I was reading this for the first time this week, starting to laugh, wondering what it would have been like if Jacob 
and God had been in a cage match with ladders and chairs bashing each other over the head like they do in WWE. This is obviously not what happened in that wrestling match between God and Jacob. But Jacob's tussle with God was quite difficult. And it was memorable. Jacob, as we know, was the second born son of Isaac. His grandfather was Abraham. Jacob had an older brother named Esau. And during his childhood, Jacob and his mother, uh, Rebekah, schemed to take away Esau's birthright. You remember that, don't you? The birthright was extremely important during these days. The firstborn son was the one to whom the family estate was given, which is in this time primarily meant all the livestock. So in Genesis chapter 25, we find the story of how Jacob baited Esau into selling his birthright for a bowl of stew. And after receiving that birthright from Esau, Jacob deceived his own father into blessing him him as the heir to the estate. Esau realized the mistake that he had made and vowed to kill Jacob. And so Rebekah instructed Jacob to leave and flee to Laban, her brother, and live with him. So Jacob follows her instructions and ends up marrying one of Laban's daughters after seven years of labor for Laban. However, Jacob intends to marry Rachel, But instead, he ends up marrying Leah, and he begins his family. Finally, after seven more years of labor, Laban allows Jacob to marry Rachel. By now, you're getting the picture, aren't you? Jacob's life was hard. Hard to bear because of the decisions that he made to deceive his father and his brother, Jacob spent his entire life looking over his shoulder, waiting for Esau to be there to kill him. He lived a life of fear and regret, which leads us to this story from Genesis chapter 32, which we heard just a few moments ago. In this passage, Jacob is preparing for a battle with Esau, and he sent presents over to Esau with with hopes to appease Esau enough so that Esau won't kill him. That night, Jacob sent his family and everything else that he had across the Jabbok for safety from Esau, but an unexpected warrior is awaiting him. The Bible says that Jacob wrestled with that man all night long, the entire night. Like I said to the children, it wasn't just a couple of moments, it was the entire night. Jacob and this man wrestling, neither could best the other until the battle continued into daybreak. And it was at daybreak that the other man struck Jacob on the hip and pulled his hip out of socket. The battle continued as the man said, let me go. But Jacob insisted that the man bless him before he finished the fight. The man asks Jacob his name, and Jacob answers. Then the man says, Your name's no longer Jacob, but Israel, because you've wrestled with God and man, and you have prevailed. As I read this story, I'm reminded of the fact that we wrestle throughout our lives. Maybe not in the same way as Jacob, maybe not physically, although maybe some of us have wrestled at times in our lives. But we all experience times in our lives when we are searching for who we really are. And unfortunately, many times result in us choosing what seems to be best for us at the time, but it is something beyond our limits. 
It's a hard truth, but it's still true that we have limits to what we can do in this world. These limits make us uncomfortable because we begin to question, what if I had just been smarter? Would that door have closed if I had been stronger? Or in Jacob's case, what if I had been born first? Jacob wrestled with his limitations throughout his entire life. From the time that he was born, he wrestled with the fact that it was because he was the second born that he was unable to accept his father's estate. And so he took matters into his own hands and it affected the rest of his life. Everything. Every moment from that point was complicated and difficult. We constantly look back at the past for answers, but didn't find any. Paul, Parker Palmer, the, the great Quaker pastor, writes in his book, Let Your Life Speak, that this temptation to constantly ask, what if, is difficult to suppress, but that there is as much guidance in the door that closes behind us as there is in the door that is open ahead of us. The the temptation to look back on the past, past decisions or life circumstances is a difficult one to fight, but it's one that we have to reject. Similar to asking the question, what if digging through hardship is an integral part of following God? We all experience adversity. And during many of these difficult and hard times, we ask, how much longer are you going to allow this to happen to me? This question leads to anger about God's apparent apathy toward our pain. This pain leads us to ask other questions like, why? Why did this happen to me? Why weren't you there? And as I think about it, it's easy for us to allow questions like these to lead us to denounce our faith. But it's also possible for moments like these to help us reorient ourselves toward God. Brian McLaren, the modern day theologian, once said, it is through the longest, darkest night, through the most difficult of situations of the year, that morning comes. I was speaking with one of you this week about a time of wrestling with God after the loss of a loved one. And it's through difficult moments like these, sometimes they lead us away from God because we just don't understand why God would allow bad things to happen to good people. Yet also, it's through these painful experiences that we begin to see God in other people. And eventually, it's through the pain and despair that we are led back into the loving arms of God. It's during this return to God that we, like Jacob, deepen our understanding of who God is and who we are. And as we find in the Scriptures, after this long battle with, the, with God overnight, and after the blessing that gives Jacob a new name, Israel, Jacob says, tell me your name. Tell me your name. The man responds, why is it that you ask my name? And then blesses Jacob. You know, I think Jacob asked this question because he didn't really know who he was wrestling. He didn't know who he was in that moment either. 
He didn't know the man. He didn't know himself. Because he had wrongly decided for himself so many times that he became a shell of the person that God created him to be. He questioned so many times those things in the past that had haunted him that he was no longer living the life that God had given him. And yet, after this night of pain, Jacob realized that it had been God who he had been wrestling with his entire life. And finally, after seeing the face of God, as the Scriptures say, he saw the person that God created him to be. Brothers and sisters, we all wrestle with God. We go through periods of time when we, like Jacob, don't know who we really are. And we have these fights of identity to discover again the person that God created us to be. We leave those battles with scars and bruises and sometimes broken hearts, but we also leave those battles with a renewed sense of purpose for the kingdom. But I think it's important that we point out in the life of Jacob and and also for us that as Terence uh, Fretheim says, it's not Jacob who takes the initiative in this battle. God initiates the battle. The issue in this story is not how God responds to a battle, but how we respond. To the battle. At the least, this means that Israel's response to God ought not to be passive or submissive. Moses appears as a new Jacob in this regard. An individual may hang on to God, claiming the promises, persisting in the relationship. Yet when it comes to the struggles in daily lives, sometimes we lose faith. But instead, brothers and sisters, we are called to count upon mixing it up with God from time to time. Mixing it up with God as He challenges us and convicts us, evaluates us and judges us. We we have to place our life at risk knowing that the one who loses his life will find it. God honors the relationship both by engaging in the struggle in the first place and by persisting in that struggle through thick and thin. The most meticulous of preparations cannot guarantee a certain shape for the future. God may break into life and force a new direction for thought and action at any time. When we read this story, we need to read it as one in which God initiates the battle with Jacob. And when we do read it that way, we begin to understand why God blesses Jacob with the name Israel. In Hebrew, the word Israel means God contends. It's God who contends with Jacob's inner self. It's God who initiates the turmoil in Jacob's life. It's God who fights with Jacob through the entire life or through the entire night and through his entire life. And as we begin to, to grasp the significance of that, then we recognize that it is God who does the same with us. God initiates the match. Which leads us to the question, are we willing to accept the invitation? Are we willing to tangle with God? When God initiates the fight, are we willing to accept it? Some of us are wrestling with God right now. 
If you are, be encouraged because there is hope. There is hope at the end of the match. Because one day, and it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may be for a while now, one day we will clearly understand who we are created to be. Because God initiates the battle with us. And if you aren't wrestling with God right now, maybe you need to accept the invitation. Maybe you need to, in the, in the moments of your uncertainty of who you are, maybe you need to have a little bit more courage to accept God's challenge because freedom is on the other side. The thing about this story that's so remarkable to me is that Jacob had been living a life of bondage. He was just constantly worried about what might be on the horizon or what might be behind him. He never could get any freedom at least not until he wrestled with God. Maybe you feel bound by something in your life. Maybe you feel like there's something that you've done in your past that is unforgivable. Brothers and sisters, I I come to tell you that the Gospel tells us differently. The Gospel says to us that no matter who you are, No matter what you've done, no matter what you're currently doing, no matter what you might do in the future, nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you. Even in the midst of darkness, even in the midst of the fight, God will take care of you. Through every day, or all the way, He will take care of you. God will take care of you.